Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Let's go ahead and stand and we're going to worship together. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, I believe you are. this morning. God, I look to you. God, I look to you. 
Will you pray with me? Father God, we are humbled by your pursuit of us. God, by your goodness, by your mercy and your love running after us. 
Father, we're thankful that no matter where we find ourselves, whether that is running down a road that is pretty dark and difficult, where we might struggle to see you and sense you, that that does not stop your goodness. That does not impede your pursuit. And so, Father, we just come before you in these moments that we gather together. And, Father, just ask that you continue to speak to our hearts in the deep places. To where they're not, that not only just become something that we can sing about, but that becomes a reality. An inward reality of your goodness and your mercy and your love for us and your pursuit of us. So, Father, continue to speak through your spirit in these moments as we sing, as we hear from your word, as we pray together. Father, we want to lift you up and we want to hear from you. That's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. And if you can help us out, uh, if you can, we're going to do a little shifting, shift down towards the windows. If you can kind of create some space uh, just so that our ushers and folks can uh, know that there's some open seats. I know that you're like, I don't really want to be that close. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. And here's an invite for you. If, if you don't want to feel like jammed in, there's great room down at the lodge and uh, <laughs> there's live worship every single Sunday morning. So that might even be something that you think about next week of like going, let's go check out the lodge uh, and see what that's about. <clears throat> but we are so glad that you chose to spend part of your weekend with us and uh, are here at Hope. And if you're new to Hope, if this is maybe your first time uh, gathering with us, we hope that you find this place uh, encouraging, that you that it's the things that you hear and the people that you experience are helpful uh, just to help take that next journey, that next step on your own journey, whatever that looks like. We're glad that you're here. You should have received a worship guide as you came in. It's going to give you information about things that are going on here at Hope uh, and ways that you can connect to that. And then also at the bottom portion of it is a connect card. And you can fill that out with any information you'd like to share with us or any questions that you might have. And someone from our team would love to connect with you uh, during this next week. A couple of things that I would love for you to be aware about uh, is we are less than a month away from taking about 350-ish teenagers and young adults and adult leaders to what we call Winter Weekend. And uh, yes, yes, it is coming. And uh, so we just wanted to say, if you aren't signed up yet, if you are a student from sixth grade all the way to a senior, or maybe you know somebody or know some kids that are running around your neighborhood or running around your house that uh, would love to experience this, it's a great weekend. Uh, there's going to be a ton of fun. There's going to be great worship, deepening of relationships, hearing who God is and who we can become in him. And we've just seen over the years, God used times that we get away together to just do some incredible work, deep work in the lives of students and the lives of leaders. And so we encourage you guys to sign up, join us. We're going to be in North, at North Bay Adventure Camp up in Maryland. And uh, if you have any questions or what, what, if you need any information, you can be it online or you can contact the students team. Oh, and also, if you are a young adult and you're like, man, I, I want to go to that, you can come as work crew, okay? So you can come along and serve all weekend long. Those folks uh, have their own experience, and it has been a rich one as we look out over, over the years. And so we encourage you to, to join us for Winter Weekend. Also, if you've got a student that is in eighth grade or is a senior, we have monthly gatherings that are about to start up. We call them our eighth grade experience and our senior experience. And really, this is trying to prepare them for this next phase of life. As you, as you know, there's these times where we've got to move on from things of, of, that we've known to things that might be a little bit unknown. And so we want to help them the best way that we can by just coming alongside them, providing them spiritual guidance, but also practical guidance. I mean, as an eighth grader, when you're going into high school, it's like there's a part of you that's like, are the seniors going to eat me? Like, what if I don't know where to go and who, how am I going to navigate these relationships? And man, we used to hang out all in, through kindergarten and now they don't want to hang Like 
all these things go on in the, in the head of an eighth grader. And so we want to come along and help them the best we can. And then for our seniors as they're graduating and moving on to the next phase of life, whether that's work or college or whatever that looks like, we want to give them some spiritual and practical skills uh, to be able to help them not just to survive the next phase, but to thrive in the next phase. And that could be how do I handle finances? How do I, you know, cook past ramen? Um, how do I... You know, how do I change uh, the oil in my car or change the tire if it goes flat? And one of the success stories from senior experience, just this past week I heard about it, uh, we had uh, one of our female students uh, basically got a flat tire and their boyfriend was with her and she said, here, I just want you to film this because I know exactly what to do, watch me work. And so she like, yeah, she changed her tire and as a result of learning how to do that, in senior experience. And so we encourage you guys uh, to sign up, join us for those weekly gatherings. First senior experience starts Thursday, this coming Thursday, the 25th from 7 to 8.30 in the lodge. And then eighth grade experience is next Sunday from 9.30 until 11 down in the lodge. So we look forward to that. And if, you don't, if that doesn't pertain to you and you're like, hey, can you stop talking about kids because I don't have that, uh, those guys, pray for them. Pray for them. That's how we are partners. That's how we are community is that we know how difficult it is. Whatever phase of life you find yourself in, when you're moving to the next one, it's hard. So pray for us and pray for them. We appreciate it. Uh, another way that you can partner with us is through giving. It's something that we do every single week here. Uh, it's an act of worship of us saying, thank you, God, for your goodness, for that goodness that is running after me, that goodness that continues to pursue me. Thank you, and I want to give back, and I want to partner in what you're doing here at Hope. And so there's many different ways that you can give, whether that's online or text, uh, or if you came prepared to give, you can give uh, in the wooden boxes as you leave. But we are thankful just to be on the journey with you, to partner with you, to give together, whether that's finances, whether that is time, whether that is prayer, it is coveted. And so thank you uh, for being on it because we are all here together, not just to gather so that we can just be Hope Church in here, but it's truly so that the gospel can go out from these walls through the relationships that are represented in this room and we partner together with what God is gonna do. And so thank you for being a part of that. We're going to continue uh, worshiping uh, through our, in, our, in our series, Wise and True, and our senior pastor, David Dwight, is going to come and share what God has laid on his heart. I'm looking forward to that, and uh, we are just so glad that you're here. And again, we're going to continue to worship. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Good morning. Glad to see you. Welcome, particularly if you're new. We're really glad you're here and hope you're encouraged by being here. Hi to you if you're joining us online or if you're in one of the other places on our campus. So if you could know some of the most important information that is available to you, some of the most important information that could impact your life as much as anything, would you want to know it? There are many studies that say our relationships, our interactions with other people, are one of the most significant contributors to the well-being of our lives. I don't love the word success because it's a wonky word, but let's use it for a moment that the nature of our relationships is one of the most significant contributors to the success, the experiences of our lives. But relationships are nuanced, and our participation in them is also nuanced. So what is this information? If you could have this information, I mean, this information is gold if you could get it. Would you want to have it? What is it? This is the answer to the question, how do people experience you? How do people experience you? 
Not what do you think about you, not what are your intentions about you, not what did you mean when you were with that person, but how do they experience you? It's a remarkably important batch of information. I have tried to pay attention to this for a long time, and I'll give you more context about how this really got on my radar a number of years ago. But you know the term glass ceilings? We run into glass ceilings. Like there was some invisible thing, I couldn't see it or identify it or name it, but it just seemed to be the terminus to my progress. Whether it's like career progress, I just didn't seem to get offered these types of promotions. Whether it's the quality or the nature of my relationships, there just seemed to be this level and that was about it. And we sort of use the phrase, those are glass ceilings. I think the answer to the question, how do people experience you, is probably one of the biggest things that's involved with the glass ceilings. Okay, so let me read from Proverbs chapter 12. If you're new to this this week, we're moving through the book of Proverbs. It's quite a unique book in the Bible. It's not like any of the others. So this is Proverbs chapter 12. To learn, you must love discipline. It's stupid to hate correction. Thanks for that straight talk. That gets us off to a good start. The Lord approves of those who are good, but he condemns those who plan wickedness. Wickedness never brings stability, but the godly have deep roots. A worthy wife is a crown for her husband, but a disgraceful woman is like cancer in his bones. The plans of the godly are just. The advice of the wicked is treacherous. The words of the wicked are like a murderous ambush, but the words of the godly save lives. The wicked die and disappear, but the family of the godly stands firm. A sensible person wins admiration, but a warped mind is despised. Better to be an ordinary person with a servant than to be self-important, but have no food. The godly care for their animals, but the wicked are always cruel. A hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies has no sense. Thieves are jealous of each other's loot, but the godly are well-rooted and they bear their own fruit. The wicked are trapped by their own words, but the godly escape such trouble. Wise words bring many benefits and hard work brings rewards. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. A fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. An honest witness tells the truth. A false witness tells lies. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Truthful words stand the test of time, but lies are soon exposed. Deceit fills hearts that are plotting evil. Joy fills hearts that are planning peace. No harm comes to the godly, but the wicked have their fill of trouble. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. The wise don't make a show of their knowledge, but fools broadcast their foolishness. Work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. Worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word cheers a person up. The godly give good advice to their friends. The wicked lead them astray. Lazy people don't even cook the game they catch, but the diligent make use of everything they find. The way of the godly leads to life. That path does not lead to death. So it was just about this time of year. It was January in 1991. So we're talking like 33 years ago. And I was in a January term class in my last year of seminary. And this was a required J term class. And in the January term, a lot of you are familiar with this kind of thing, it was a short month segment. And so the class met every day of the week from nine to noon through January, highly concentrated version. And this class, which was, did I mention a required class? It was not an optional class. It was called Group Dynamics and Behavioral Change. 
And this is how the class worked. For the first half of the month, each day you would have different teammates and you'd be given a research project. And so you'd be in class in the morning, you'd be working on this research, divided up into groups, hustling after your information. Then you'd work together in the afternoon. Next morning you present findings. And you do this every day. And the team is mixed every time. So you're working with different people every time. The second half of the class, second half of the month, the class starts and the teacher, the professor, was a PhD in psychology, puts a circle of chairs in the room. And I remember about, I want to say about 15 or so people in the class. And then there's one chair in the middle. And the way the second half of the class worked was, each person had a turn sitting in the middle and everybody took time to tell them how they experienced them. Now, if you're thinking this sounds like a wonderful opportunity for self-esteem, <laughs> uh, you're missing what was going on in that classroom. This was less self-help seminar and more Shark Tank. This was more feeding frenzy, blood in the water kind of stuff. You're like, seminary? I thought that's supposed to be all kind of nice and squishy and holy. Not this class. So each person would have 90 minutes in the center of the circle. And the professor would facilitate the feedback. The first half, tell us how you experienced David in positive ways, and we're going to talk about that. And the second half, 45 minutes, is tell us how you experienced David to be difficult. And we'll talk about that. Okay, so some of the positive ways were things like articulate, engaging, energetic, persuasive, visionary. So that all felt great. And then some of the more challenging experiences. Domineering, not interested in others' opinions, quick to talk, slow to listen, strong on your own opinions, and... This class, I mentioned it was a requirement, right? It was a required class. Was some of the most painful, most helpful information I've ever gotten in my entire life. Right, because I think you understand what we're saying here. When you're hearing the, let's call it hard feedback, inside of you is like, well, no, that's not me. That's not what I mean. That's not what I'm like. That's not my character. That's not what I intended. But none of that matters. Because the feedback is simply, how did people experience you? And knowing how people experience you, I mean, this information is gold. And none of us are perfect. We've all got our flat sides. So what are you going to do with that information, all that feedback you get? Oh, you could amp up and power up, and you could say things like, well, that's just who I am, which would be foolishness. Or you could pay attention and you could say, I really want to grow in these areas. I want to be mindful of this. You see, because I think you get it, the way people experience you in your groups and your teams at work, this is huge. It's massive. In your sports teams, in your school small group project teams, I mean, all over the place, in your family life, this is massive. So, the Proverbs are just a very unique book in the Bible. They're like an MRI for our character. If we read the Proverbs and we really want to enter them and engage them, this is like having an MRI of our character. And, you know, you read through it, and you're going to read certain verses, and you're going to feel encouraged, like, that's helpful. I feel pretty good about that. And then you're going to read some stuff, and it's going to be convicting, and it's going to kind of reveal some things, and you're going to think, wow, I'm not sure I like what I see about that. If that's the way you're engaging it, that's really good. That's the way it's intended to be, to seek to grow and to hear God speak to us. So as an MRI to our character, Proverbs 17.3 describes it this way. It says, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. One of the things that I've learned about this phrase, tests the heart, is that this has a lot to do with motives. 
What are my motives? You pick the category in your life. What are your motives about pursuing this job? What are your motives in this relationship? What are your motives in this decision? Motives, I've come to appreciate, are massively important. Because any motives that are askew from what is good and true and honest is going to cause torque and challenge. And none of us are perfectly pure in our motives, right? Hopefully we can all enter this together. And if I could gently say it, the person who says, well, I'm perfectly pure in my motives, is who the Proverbs would call a fool. So we're all on this growth journey and invitation together. Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Many years ago, I heard this analogy, and it's about silversmiths. And I'm not a silversmith, so if you are and this is wrong, let me know. But the metaphor works regardless. And the analogy is this. When a silversmith is working to purify their silver, they heat it up until it's molten, until it's in the liquid form, and the dross, that is the impurities in the silver, will begin to float to the top of the liquefied silver, and then you use like this little, you know, filtering thing, and you skim the dross off the top. And this happens over a period of time, you keep skimming the dross off the top. The illustration is this. You would have like this big ladle, and when you scoop the silver and the silversmith can look in there and see his reflection clearly, then the silver is pure. And the analogy to our life with God is, as fire tests the purity of silver and gold, the Lord tests the heart. As God is refining us to make us pure, when he dips in the silver that is us and he can see his reflection in us, then we're growing into this place of purity. And this place of purity will also always, as the Proverbs and other places in the Bible tell us, be the place where living gets really good. So Proverbs is like an MRI for our character. The challenge is we human beings, we're really complex. We're endlessly complex. We're this incredible toss salad of experience, emotion, personality, viewpoints, memories. It's just an incredibly complex stew that we're in. David White, author, has written, and he says, human beings are always and always will be a frontier between what is known and what is unknown. The hope that a human being can achieve complete honesty and self-knowledge with regard to themselves is a fiction and a chimera. Okay, so he's saying that human beings are incredibly complex. The fact that we're gonna get to the full, true honesty of ourselves, he says, is a fiction and a chimera. And because he says complete honesty is part of it, I have to tell you that I had no idea what chimera means when I first read it. And I really wanted to be impressive and pull it off, like, yeah, he knows what chimera means. I had no idea. So maybe you know what it means, but maybe you don't. Chimera is like wishful thinking, pipe dream, like not going to happen. Human beings are always and always will be a frontier between what is known and what is unknown. And I think you get it. It's not just us knowing each other. It's us knowing ourselves. The hope that a human being could achieve complete honesty and self-knowledge with regard to themselves, a fiction, a chimera. Okay, so the Proverbs give us these pictures, these character categorizations, and I want to lay some out today. One of them is the wise person. The wise person is lifted up as a paragon in the Proverbs. The wise person seeks insight, seeks correction, seeks shaping. Okay, so these words, I'm going to put them together and say insight plus correction plus shaping is really what the Proverbs were talking about when they use the word discipline. When they say the wise person seeks discipline, they seek insight, they seek correction, they seek shaping. They want to know where they're difficult. They want to know where their edges are too sharp. They want to know so that they can engage people in life-giving, helpful ways. They seek it out. Right? The challenge for many of us is our emotions are like, I don't think I want to know. This is why we're complex. Okay, then there's the foolish person. In the Proverbs, the foolish person is the person who is sure they know. 
The foolish person, they're just sure that they know what's right. And to add to it, the foolish person dispenses their opinions right and left. Generally speaking, the scriptures render a picture where when we're younger, we tend to be more foolish, and when we're older, we tend to get more wise. Okay, so that's hopefully the trajectory for us. Hopefully, you can look at your life, no matter what age you are, and say, in the past when I was younger, I was more foolish. Today, hopefully, I'm more wise. One of the things that comes with the foolish is they're sure they know, and they don't even know that they don't know. So, for example, I remember before Elizabeth and I had children, I had every answer to parenting. I, I knew exactly how to parent. I knew how to get the best results, how to come up with all the right Christian content, how to have your kids turn out beautiful, perfect, yes, daddy kids. And then I had kids. And then I learned that these little critters are a tumbleweed of complexity and that this is so much more challenging than I ever thought. We have a phrase in our family that we laugh about sometimes and the phrase is frequently wrong but never in doubt. This is like when you're kind of amped up and you're talking about something and you're like going for it. And the others at the table are like, they have no idea what they're talking about. But you know what? You carry it out with convincing articulation and you go for it. And it's like, mm, frequently wrong. But give them credit, never in doubt. This is the foolish person. In the Proverbs, there's an overarching goal and it is awareness and humility. And awareness and humility is connected to honesty and truth and understanding. And these are all bundled together in what we would call growth. So this honesty about who we are, our understanding and so on. One of my favorite little Latin phrases, if I'm remembering properly, I think it's the state seal phrase for North Carolina, is esse quam viteri, which means to be rather than to seem, to be rather than to seem. That's a very sort of Proverbs-like statement that's really challenging, all the more so in our day, because so many technology platforms, their invitation is to seem rather than to be. The Proverbs are calling us to an honest, humble awareness, and this is how we grow. And then, of course, comes this interesting question of balance, right? Because I suppose you could be hearing this and you could think, all right, well, wait a minute. So I'm supposed to be thoughtful about what other people think of me or at least how they experience me. That's true. But this all is asking for balance points because the pendulum out way too far on this side is, I've never thought about it and I don't care. That's way too far out this way. But swing the pendulum too far this way and you become paralyzed with worry about what everybody thinks of you in every moment. So this is not easy. And frankly, for a lot of us, the growth process is kind of goes like this. And hopefully we're moving toward a settled balance point. And this is a place of humility. What that settled balance point would be, would be something like this a realistic assessment of myself with non-defensiveness about my shortcomings and weaknesses. In other words, I'm like, yes, I have them. And if all of us had this sense of, yes, I have them, well, that would reduce everybody running around trying to tell everybody you've got them. We all know that, we've got them. And then there could be this more graceful way that we can all help each other grow. One of my favorite phrases from Martin Luther is this life, therefore, is not health, but healing, not being, but becoming, for we are not yet what we shall one day be. I love that phrase because it's so hopeful. Like, okay, don't beat yourself up so badly, right? And they're saying, well, don't pay any attention to it, don't worry about it. No, we're not saying don't pay any attention to it, but we're also saying don't beat yourself up so much about it. Recognize, yep, I've got weaknesses and shortcomings, 
And humbly embracing those with non-defensiveness becomes a beautiful place of freedom. So there's an interesting little character statement here, right? It's interesting how it says that this person who takes care of their animals, it's like a little oddball phrase in there. Like pay attention to the way the good person cares for their animals. I heard many years ago, I don't know who said it, where it came from, said if you want to have an insight into the character of a man, pay attention to the way he treats his dog and his mother. Okay, truly. And the more I thought about it, I thought it's really insightful. If you want to have a sense of the character of a, of a man, how does he treat his dog? And how does he treat his mother? And how does their relationship work? Okay, so then we get this phrase in the Proverbs a lot, a tree of life. It'll say something like, this and this and this will become a tree of life. This and this will become a tree of life. So I've been working around with this tree of life and I've been drawing these diagrams. I thought about trying to bring a big easel out here today and do a little you know, art project and draw it, but I thought that's gonna get too cumbersome. But I think you can do the art project in your mind's eye. Let's talk about the tree of life according to the Proverbs. First are the roots. If you're gonna draw this, right, you've got the ground line, it's more or less horizontal. And then you got all these roots going out beneath it. The roots are the part of the tree you don't see. Arborists will almost always tell you the quality of the tree depends 100% on the quality of the root system. The nutrients, the roots, the whole thing. So the roots are complex and they spread and they're all there under the ground, but we don't see them. In the Proverbs, the roots are character. So if you want to do a diagram, you'd be like, you have a little line, you know, the roots under here, that's character. Then we get to the trunk, and the main trunk of this big spreading oak tree is wisdom. And out of that main trunk of wisdom, I'm just going to suggest our four main branches. So you're drawing your tree, you got one branch, another branch, another, another one. And of course, all the four main branches have branches that branch off of them. But the four main branches, truth is one of them. One of the main branches that comes from wisdom, that comes from character, is truth. And truth comes in two ways. One is honesty. You're an honest person. You don't tell lies. You don't spin the story. You tell it as it is. The other one is you're, in a sense, the truth is about accuracy. You understand the truth of yourself. You understand the truth of other people. But this is really hard, isn't it? Because we are emotional creatures. And inside of us, we have a deep, deep, deep desire to be seen as being right and good and admirable. And it's normal that we human beings, as a result of our emotions, will tell things not exactly true. Now, here we get into the gray area, because right? says, are you a liar? Well, it's not like a lie. It wasn't like black is white, but it was more like, hey, when I heard you tell that story, that's not exactly how it went. We're masters at spinning the stories in our favor. This is part of the journey of being human beings. So one of the main branches is truth. That is, we're honest and we're accurate. Next one is trust. Another big branch is about trust. Who do you trust and what do you trust in your life? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? The Proverbs are pleading with us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But what are we trusting in? If most of us are honest and we're accurate, we're trusting in God, trusting in the Lord to varying degrees. We're trusting our money, we're trusting the economy, we're trusting our circumstances, my life is going the way I want it to go, we're trusting our jobs, you get it. This is saying trust God with all your heart. Then we've got humility. Humility is that balanced, non-defensive self. Humility is an accurate understanding of who I am. It's seeing myself the way God sees me, and that's a journey. It's not overly negative and self-punitive. It's not overly inflated and arrogant. It's an honest assessment of myself, a balanced, non-defensive self. And you've heard it 100 times, but I think it bears repeating. The humble person is not the person who thinks less of themselves. The humble person thinks of themselves less. So then the last one is discipline. 
And I mentioned this. This is the word discipline. It's the person who is seeking insight and correction and shaping. So character is the big part of the tree of life. That's the root system under the ground. Wisdom is the trunk, the main four branches, truth, trust, humility, and discipline. But our emotions make this journey a real challenge. Our emotions will distort things. And beginning to grow toward maturity is to understand that. So I recently finished a book that I think is really helpful. It's called The Seven Primal Questions by a guy named Mike Foster. And Mike Foster posits in the book that there are seven questions that are operative in us as human beings, probably by the time we're teenagers and into adult life. Okay, I'm going to tell you what they are. Don't wig out if you won't remember them. You can Google this or we'll put it on social media. The seven questions he says are inside of us as human beings are, am I safe? Am I secure? Am I loved? Am I wanted? Am I successful? Am I good enough? Do I have purpose? And what he suggests in these seven questions is that all of us have one of them that's the prevailing one. And that much of our living is being lived out of us wanting to get a yes answer to that question. And much of our behavior, much of our interactions, much of our ways of relating with people, whether we knew it or not, are being driven by this deficit. The person who wonders, are they loved? They feel a deficit of it. And so their behaviors and interactions are to try to get a yes answer to am I loved? I think you get it. The person who wonders, am I good enough? They have a deficit of a sense of they're good enough and they're working hard to get that deficit filled. The behaviors that come out of that are really significant in who we are as people. So of course, if you're into this as far as we are now, I read the book and of course I want to self-diagnose, like which one is my main question? And I can play around with that and maybe I can do a reasonably good job but really, if you want to know the answer to which one is your main question, you should ask a few people who know you well. They should say, well, this is what I observe in you. I think your main question is, am I good enough? Am I loved? Am I want you? You get it. The challenge is, it's hard for us to get honest about this. Sometimes we're not able to see the truth. That is an intellectual understanding of it. Sometimes the challenge is we're not able to accept the truth. Even if we could see it, we can't accept it. Either way, we're avoiding it. And so the goal is to come to the truth because what? The truth will set us free. The challenge is we're fragile people and our emotions are so afraid of being thought less of that it becomes very hard for us to pursue the truth. So we need one massive thing to counteract all that fear. And that one massive thing is love. The only thing big enough, strong enough to help us take this journey toward freedom is love. This is the love of God that is so high and so wide and so long and so deep that it is that one power that beautifully brings us to life when we're facing our deficits. It is that one assurance of your good enoughness and all the other questions that Mike Foster mentions. This journey of becoming what we could as the Proverbs invite us, it's a hard one. So I read this quote, you must be able to give up what you are to become what you would like to be. You must be able to give up what you are to become what you would like to be. Of course, I read it and I'm like, well, you know, that seems obvious. You don't have to be Albert Einstein to say that. Actually, you do have to be Albert Einstein to say that because Albert Einstein said it. So, not only was a scientific genius, apparently a pretty psychological genius as well. You have to be able to give up what you are to become what you would like to be. That is a massively huge statement. Because what we are is familiar. What we are is life as I know it. What we're being invited to is a life that is healed and whole, but it's going to have us have to give up some of what we are. What if we could help each other in that journey in a community, a church, that keeps expressing to each other this incredible love of God that is the one thing big enough to help heal us through this. 
See, no behavioral teaching is going to solve these issues. No legalistic religion is going to solve these issues. That can make you behave certain ways, but that's not going to give the healing that we're talking about and that the Proverbs are inviting us to. Okay, so let me close with this part. The Proverbs invite a question, basically, are you a learner or a knower? And the invitation is that we would be learners throughout our entire lives. Mike Foster in his book says, the average child asks 250 questions a day. The average adult asks 20 questions a day. So I'm doing a little simple math here. When we become adults, we become 90 plus percent less inquisitive and curious than when we were little kids. We have begun to slide to becoming what we think are knowers. So let's go back to 250 questions a day. I learned that Billy Graham apparently in his life read five Psalms, five chapters of Psalms, and one chapter of Proverbs every single day of his life. Meaning he would go through the book of Psalms and Proverbs every month for the entirety of his life. Imagine the learning and the growth that would come with that. The Proverbs have four big topics. This is rapid fire, ready? One of them is the tongue. The tongue has the power to heal or to harm. You can give life, you can create trust and grow community with what you say or you can harm it. The cultural false axiom here is, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Whoever said that was a fool. I bet every one of us can remember words that have hurt us. And some of us would say those words were decades ago. The next one, a big one in chapters 5, 6, and 7, we're not going in depth in it, but we shouldn't pass it over, is the topic of adultery. And what the Proverbs say is that adultery becomes a violation to a person and a relationship, and the violation causes violence emotionally and psychologically speaking. The culturally false axiom on this is, I can do this without causing pain, I can pull it off without creating harm. And that's a false axiom. The next one is truth. Seek it always. The false cultural axiom is, the truth hurts. Well, this one's a little more nuanced because sometimes it's not so easy to hear it. But the truth of truth is that the truth is always your friend. You always want it. You always want it. You might say, I don't, actually, I don't always want it. No, I get that, right? You always want it. The truth is always your friend. Because any degree to which you're living your life that is apart from truth is going to create torque and twisting and difficulty. So we always want the truth. Truth is always your friend. And finally, trust. And this is where I want to close. Above all, trust God, the Proverbs say. So it asks a deep question. What do I really trust? What am I really trusting with my life? Now, maybe you're new at Hope and you're beginning to engage questions about this and about religion, Christianity, which is all beautiful. And you've got this question, what do I trust most in my life? And maybe I'm at a place where I need to begin to say, God, I want to trust you with my life. That's a beautiful place. Now, those of you who have been in church for 30, 40, 15, 60 years, you're thinking, oh, well, this doesn't apply to me. No, actually, here's where I think we have to be really diligent. I think it becomes very possible for the person who's been in church for 30, 40, 50 years to realize that God has become a side habit in my life. My real trust is my money, my investment websites, my job future. And I know I go to all the Bible studies and I've got highlighted verses all over my Bible, but actually I'm not really trusting God. I've constructed a life that looks like I trust God, but I trust these other things. So the Proverbs call us to trust God. So I want to take about 45 seconds to allow time to just have some silent reflection and prayer. And maybe talk to God about your sense of what you trust. And maybe you want to say to God for the first time in your life, God, I want to ask you. I want to give my life to you as the one I trust. 
Or maybe you're a person who realizes, God, I've been saying and living like I trust you, but I realize it's not you I'm trusting. Let's take just a little bit for silent prayer, and then we'll have our closing worship. So, Father in heaven, we come to you in this place, this room, wherever we may be this morning. And with silent prayer, I just envision these words rising to heaven as though we can see them rising to heaven. All of us laying before you, our thoughts, our lives. And Lord, would you move in each of our lives to help us come into the life that's really life, the Proverbs life where receiving your love leads us to beauty and wholeness. And Lord, I pray for anybody here today who is in deep need of a breakthrough. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will move and work in their life. Maybe it's one, maybe it's many. Would you help us, Lord, with all the obstacles, emotional and otherwise, that keep us from coming to the truth that is you, your gospel, your love, your healing, and your life. Meet with us, please, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to close with a pretty familiar hymn. Um, and there's this line, there's, it's the second line we sing, and it's a little, the wording of it is just a little strange. So the song is, Be Thou My Vision. So be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. What does that mean? It means only you, God. It means what David mentioned in the Proverbs. Above all, trust God. So when we sing that, let's think about, above all, trust God. Would you stand and worship with us? Thank you.
So there's only one thing that can come into our lives and bring the healing for us to move along in this beautiful invitation journey, and it's the love of God. So vast that it is more beautiful and bigger than any and all of our deficits and fears. So as we go this week together, I pray that you being rooted and established in love will have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and that you might know this love that surpasses knowledge and be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen, everybody. Have a great week.